Okay, it's 2.40. We should get started. So let's see. We're on to lesson nine. And lesson nine, it's a short lesson. It normally takes about two and a half classes. And we have two classes to go. Uh, the last class on Monday will be exclusively on search for extraterrestrial intelligence. There'll be a little bit of exoplanets, planets orbiting other stars mixed in with that, but search for life. So that leaves me with one class to do everything else, which is again about one and a half classes worth of material. So what I'm gonna do is get as far as I can, which is uh, from what I just saw in the previous section through comets, and then the remaining material, which will be asteroids like in the asteroid belt and also earth crossing and earth impacting asteroids and mass extinctions. I'll do that in a separate video uh, this weekend. I'll also do an overview of exoplanets in that video. Basically again about half a class of material that I'll just shoot probably on Sunday and put it on the YouTube site. I have an old video but it's pretty crappy. The audio is really bad so I'll just record it and update it for new developments. So that's the plan. So a class today, half a class that you'll make up, just watch it at your convenience. And then on Monday, we'll have our SETI workshop and you should all come and be prepared to use the e-polling interface. We originally built it for that. That's why it's called SETI. It has some other functionality to it and it should be a fun class. Okay. Uh, other calendar items. So homework nine will be due on Tuesday. And this is the same stuff I said last time. I'll just repeat it. Homework nine will be due on Tuesday and I've extended it till the end of the day, 11.59 PM to give you a little bit more time, but also to give me time to hold office hours on Tuesday in case anyone has any questions about any of the homework questions. And I'll have a second office hours next week on Friday at the end of the week, uh, for those of you getting ready for the final, which will be the following Monday, Monday the 23rd, I believe it is. And that will become available at noon and that will be due at noon on the next day. Now, I sent out an email about that, but I'll probably send another reminder as the final approaches. And I've talked about the final over the past couple of classes, but again, just briefly, it'll be on WebAssign, and it will be longer, it'll be about 70 questions. It's meant to be comprehensive. So everything that we've covered during the class is fair game, uh, but there'll be an emphasis on new material. Probably about half the exam will be new material, lessons seven, eight, and nine. So you wanna study homework seven, eight, and nine for that and the warm up questions that I'll post. And in fact, I'll post those warm up questions uh, maybe after class today or this weekend we're not going to do one on Monday. And it'll be the same mix that you're used to, maybe about two thirds conceptual fact-based questions and one third calculational. Anyway, um, you know, on, during a normal semester, the final takes three hours and the midterms take 50 minutes, and, but you'll have the full 24 hour period. You can come and go. Uh, if your internet goes down a little bit, I'm not going to worry about that. As long as you have a good three hour block in there, uh, you should tackle it. So don't wait to the last minute. Okay, any questions about anything logistical or science questions? I have a quick uh, question about the final. Um, would we be would it be safe to assume that the final will go in chronological order like how the previous ones were? Yep, yep, I'm going to keep it in chronological order and that should help you figure out what equations to use and stuff like that. All right, thank you. Sure. And again, my recommendation is for you to put together a cheat sheet. That's what we would be doing if it were a normal semester and you were taking the three hour exam. I'll let you come in with a sheet of notes. Of course, since it's online and you know it's open everything, but still the process of making that cheat sheet is uh, very useful for getting all this back in your mind and organizing it. Okay, let's move on to the warm up question. And some of you put in responses up. I, I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put you uh, into the um, breakout rooms and you can all compare your lists 
and then come back and repost your number. So I'll clear the board again. But let's look at the question here. Life, at least as we know it, requires liquid water. We also talked about the possibility of liquid methane, but let's just focus on liquid water. We said with life, life is carbon-based, uh, but you need a fluid medium for the carbon to come together and form complicated structures. And for us, that fluid medium was water. So we've now run through all the planets and in, in the large moons. Which of these have, have or had large bodies of liquid water? So you know, think both about water on the surface, but also subsurface. And you know, we've had a number of cases now where you have large subsurface oceans, again, either have now or had in the past. And there are lots of worlds out there that may have a thin little layer of water near the surface, but I'm really looking for ocean kind of stuff. So let's see how many you get. And don't feel bad if you miss one or get one too many. Uh, some of these can be debated, but let's just see what you get and then we'll look at my list. So grab a snapshot of the question if you need it. And I need to find the breakout rooms create new rooms. And let's see, I have 22 of you. Let's do four rooms this time. Maybe five, five rooms. Sign automatically. Seems strange. That didn't work right. Let me try again. Oh, got it. Okay, so four rooms. There we go. That looks right. Okay, I'll open the rooms and just take about a minute and cross check your lists and see what you come up with. There you go. Okay, everyone's back now. Go ahead and submit your, your best guess. How many worlds have we encountered with oceans, past or present? Likely oceans anyway. Give another 10 seconds to put a number in.
Okay, that's most of you anyway, let's see. Lots of bins in there. Maybe I'll cut it off at 10, make it a little bit easier to look at. So we got some fours, some fives. I actually came up with six. So it seems that most of you got most of them. Let's take a look at my list here. So I broke it into two categories, surface oceans and tidally heated subsurface oceans. Surface oceans, of course, earth qualifies. Uh, maybe you weren't counting earth, I don't know. Uh, and then Mars, at least in the past, pretty good evidence that had surface water. It's now frozen, has moved into the ice caps and under the ground is permafrost, but at least in the past, it had a, an ocean, hence the possibility of life. And then under the tidally heated subsurface oceans, definitely Europa, that's the most famous example, with its bright white surface, meaning it's constantly being resurfaced, all those tidal cracks, water pouring up and refreshing the surface. And Ganymede, uh, the next moon out uh, from Jupiter, uh, very large moon, lower density, so that's almost all just water in addition to whatever Europa had, add a bunch of water. Though we looked at it and uh, it seems that it was fluid in the past. There's evidence for plate tectonics. If you look at the darkest ice on the surface, the oldest ice, there's those crunch marks suggesting that we had ice plates on a water ocean, but it seems to have frozen up mostly. It's probably some slushy mixture at the moment. And then Titan going around Saturn, it's the same size, the same mass, same density, same composition, same amount of tidal heating as we saw in one of our warm up questions. So it's probably the same deal on the inside. And uh, same amount of tidal locking anyway, but yeah, same deal. And then we also came across the medium sized moon Enceladus orbiting Saturn. Uh, and it's tidally locked to Saturn, being tidally disrupted by Tethys, another medium-sized moon a little bit farther out. And that's the one with the water geysers. So you know there's a, a big ocean under there. So um, yeah, that brings us up to six. And you know, a seventh possibility, not in terms of a different world, it's the same world Titan, but we said uh, on Titan on the surface, you have liquid, not liquid water, but liquid methane. And for life, you need carbon in a fluid medium. So that might be a very different kind of life if it were to form. I'm not suggesting it did, but it's another environment that uh, is worth consideration. Anyway, those are the ones I came up with. Questions, comments? Worlds like Callisto, there may be a really thin layer of water right under the ice. Um, you know, as it got impacted, it melted the surface. So there may be like a little bit and, and perhaps some of the other worlds as well. But, uh, you know, maybe they count, maybe they don't. This didn't really have a right answer, just an opportunity to recall some of the stuff that you have encountered. Okay, let's jump into lesson nine. And I'll probably go five minutes over today just to get through comments. But anyway, lesson nine. This is our synthesis piece where we kind of want to put it all together. In lessons six and seven and eight, we went through each world individually, you know, each of the planets, uh, the seven large moons, a couple of the medium sized moons that were also interesting. So lots and lots of different uh, worlds and environments and terrains. And they're all very different. But we saw that a lot a lot of these differences, most of these differences can be attributed to a few basic things like distance from the sun, how hot or cold it is, how large the world is. Small worlds lose their heat quickly, so they may have a different geology from a large world. You know, all these variations, we could tie to the same concepts, just different input variables giving you different output results, but just a handful of concepts governed all of this. But still, there are a few things we haven't explained. And a lot of this has to do with them as a collection. So here we're looking at the solar system edge on, and we see the tilts of all the different uh, planets, their orbits. Uh, Mercury has a bit of a tilt, uh, but not still, generally it's coplanar. Everything's pretty much in the same plane, 
The biggest tilt we see here is Mercury, but keep in mind it's very close to the sun. So all these planets are occupying the same plane. They're coplanar. We haven't explained why that is. Why don't some orbit this way while others are orbiting this way? That needs to be explained. Also, we need to explain uh, the counterclockwise orbits. Almost, well, for, uh, first of all, circular orbits. We look at this here. This is a top-down view. And everything's pretty close to circular. Yes, we know the orbits are technically ellipses, but they have small eccentricities. But most, for the most part, it's pretty close to circular. And going in the same direction. So counterclockwise is viewed from the top. Everything's orbiting pretty much in the same counterclockwise direction. That needs to be explained. In fact, this counterclockwise motion is ubiquitous throughout the solar system. You zoom in down to the sun, the sun's rotating in the same counterclockwise direction. If we look at the planets and how, not just how they're orbiting, but how they're rotating on their axes, most all of them are going counterclockwise. We had a few exceptions. Venus rotates backwards. Uranus technically does. It's been tipped more than 90 degrees, so it's technically upside down, which means it's rotating backwards. And in case of Venus, Uranus, there are reasons why. We think they formed the same as the others, and then things happened to them. We call these evolutionary irregularities. Come back to that. And even the moons, the moons going around the planets, uh, they're tidally locked, so they orbit and rotate in the same direction. Almost all of the naturally forming ones anyway are counterclockwise. Captured ones like Triton and many of the small moons can be going any which way, but naturally forming ones counterclockwise. So there's this general counterclockwise flow that needs to be explained. Uh, we need to spend a little bit more time on the difference between the terrestrial worlds and the Jovian worlds, Earth-like and Jupiter-like. The ones inside the asteroid belt, really close together. They have particular properties. And then out beyond the asteroid belt, between the asteroid belt and the Kuiper belt here, we have the gas giants. We know the primary difference is uh, out beyond the asteroid belt, it's cold enough that you can retain hydrogen and helium. And there's so much hydrogen and helium that uh, you end up with giant planets. But there's a little bit more to the story. We should dig into that a little bit more, figure out how it got that way. How do you get to a giant planet? So a little bit of that. And then we need to account for all the extras, the leftovers that we've been glossing over. We have the asteroid belt here. I won't get to that today. That will be in the extra video that I'll shoot. Um, but then we have the Kuiper belt out beyond Neptune. And, and uh, I'll cover that today. And then out beyond that, we have a cloud, not in the plane. Like So here is the plane of the solar system, the Kuiper belt. That sits right here. Out around it, there's this giant sphere of objects on highly eccentric orbits called the Oort cloud. And, and these are basically our comets. These are things that got chucked out of the solar system uh, by Jupiter or Saturn, close encounters. And as they come back, uh, these are comets. These are all the wannabe planets that never got big enough to be a gas giant that formed out there. Anyway, uh, we'll talk about that today. That'd be the last thing we talk about. And anyway, the idea is to introduce a simple concept or two that can explain almost all of these things I just listed. Anything that's not explained falls under the category of evolutionary irregularities or evolutionary effects, things that happened after the formation. The solar system forms, we explain all these things I just mentioned, and then things happen. And they fall under kind of things happening falls under two categories, impacts and um, interactions like close encounters. Bodies hitting one another or moving very close to one another can mess up the order that was there initially. Okay, so that's the plan. So let's start with something called the nebular theory, let me write that down. And this will explain a lot, not everything. The nebular theory has a failing. It doesn't explain everything, but explains the, the general shape of the solar system, a disk, everything in circular orbits going in the same way. This falls out of the nebular theory. It's an idea that's been around forever, like since the 1700s, I think it dates back to. So the idea is you start with the cloud of gas, and the galaxy is just full of 
clouds of gas. That's primarily what it is, stars and gas, but lots and lots of these giant clouds of gas. And you know, they're sitting there, they're all rotating one way or the other, slowly, slow lumbering rotations. And these clouds are borderline stable. It doesn't take much to disturb them and cause them to collapse. And, and by disturb them, it could be something as simple as two clouds pass by one another and the gravity between them upsets both of them and they both start to collapse. Or it could be maybe a star exploded nearby and the supernova shell has expanded and run into the cloud. That can also cause it to collapse. And there's, we, we go into the details of this a lot more if you take Astro 102. But as this cloud collapses and gets smaller, it will spin up. It'll rotate faster and faster the smaller it gets. Something called conservation of angular momentum. And you've seen this before. You've seen a figure skater go into a spin. And as they pull their arms in, they go faster and faster and faster. And then they pull them out again and they slow down. Uh, angular momentum is one of these things that need to be conserved, like moment, linear, regular momentum needs to be conserved. Another example, I'll show you a video, not of an ice skater, but of an astronaut doing the same deal. So he's going to spin himself up here now. And the arms are in, so spinning quickly, arms out, they spin, he spins slowly, and then quickly, see how he spun up there a little bit? And particularly when he straightened up and when his knees were tucked, he was a little extended, but when he straightened up, he sped up, sped up again. Uh, during regular semesters, when we're not on Zoom, I actually do this as a demo. I have a, like a little turntable that you can stand on. I get a volunteer to come down to the front of the class. I give them like 10 pound weights for either hand and they hold their arms out and I spin them up, I ask for a volunteer of excellent balance. And then, um, pull the weights in and it's amazing how much you spin up. In fact, sometimes the volunteers shriek because they're surprised by how fast they're suddenly moving. And then they put the arms out again and slow down. So it's just a principle of physics and it plays a big role here. So as that gas cloud shrinks, it speeds up. Let me go back to the dock cam and just kind of draw this here. You then have a counteracting effect. It's not gonna keep shrinking forever because the faster it goes, you have an outward force. And you've noticed this you know, as a kid playing on playground equipment, the faster the thing spins around, the more you're thrown to the outside, the centrifugal force. So the faster it's spinning, uh, the force vectors pushing things outward grow bigger, and they eventually cancel out the force of gravity pulling everything in. And that's when the collapse halts, when those two forces are in balance, and that determines the size of the disk. Now the stuff above the disc and below the disc, uh, that just collapses down right onto the disc, just gravity pulls it down. So this is how we get our disc-like structure. And, and as we said with the solar system, it's organized into a disc-like structure. This is of course a disc of gas. We're gonna have to go from gas to planets. And we'll get there in a second. Let's just see, you know, do we see any of these discs out there? And indeed we do around young stars, we see this process in action. And this is a star called Beta Pictoris. And they've blocked out the star. The star is super bright and makes it impossible to see anything. But if you block out the star and do careful imaging, you can see the fainter stuff around it. So here you see the disk of gas. Here's a zoom in of the very central region. The star is still blocked and you actually see a kink in the disk. And we thought when we first got this image a long time ago, we thought, hey, that's probably a planet that's forming on a slightly inclined orbit. So it's kinked the disk. And as technology improved, we've been able to actually take a picture of this planet. It's one of the few planets going around other stars that we've been able to image. Yeah, most planets, we've discovered thousands and thousands of planets, but it's all indirect stuff. Either uh, they pass in front of the star blocking some of the star's light, or they're tugging on the star, causing the star to be red shifted and blue shifted as it goes around. Uh, I'll talk about these different indirect techniques in the video I'll shoot. But this is one of the few cases where we actually imaged it. You have to take the picture twice at different times and subtract them to try to cancel out the star. The star is so bright, it's not a perfect cancelization. You see it's kind of messy in there, but you do see the planet 
and you do this over and over again, you can see the planet moving around. So it's one of the few cases where we've imaged a planet, which is kind of cool. And you can see here it's out at a distance, kind of like Saturn's orbit around the sun. Here's an artist rendering of the Beta Pictori, Pic Pictori system. And uh, I only show this because they actually did a good job. They got the scales right and the colors right. And the farther out you get into the disk, the colors get redder and darker. And that's because of dust mixed in with the gas. And we're going to see that dust plays a really important role. And here's the, the planet uh, forming out there in the outskirts. So that's the idea. You have a disk of gas. And the gas starts to stick together, forming larger and larger bodies. It's a process that we call accretion. Let me write that down. Where one atom bumps into another atom and they stick together, and then another atom bumps into and sticks to that, and then another grouping of atoms that have stuck together stick to that one, and you grow larger and larger things until eventually you grow planets. But uh, let me just see what's next. Yeah. In but this is where the nebular theory fails. The nebular theory gives us the right geometric shape. It gets all the gas there, but we start plugging this into computers and it just took forever to grow the planets. This process of accretion, it was too slow. And you don't have forever. You have a small window of time, about 10 million years. I know that sounds like a lot, million, but again, our solar system has been around four and a half billion and the universe 13.8 billion. So 10 million years is nothing. That's the time it takes between getting to this stage, this disk of gas, and the star turning on. There's a concentration of gas at the center. We call it a protostar. It's not yet fusing hydrogen into helium. It's just contracting. It's warm because it's contracting. Uh, things form hot. As it contracts, it, it heats up. Uh, but that only lasts so long. Eventually, it hits the right densities and temperatures that it turns on. It fuses hydrogen into helium. Then it's producing its own energy and it's going to produce a wind. Gas is going to flow off the surface. Light is going to come out of it more so than before. Um, well, uh, even the protostar produces some light. But anyway, gas comes out of it, light comes out of it. And both of those things will push all the gas out of the solar system. So all the gas that was fueling accretions can be pushed out when the star ignites. And that's the end of accretion. You can't build planets if all the gas has been pushed away. So you only have millions of years to do this. And it just doesn't happen because the nebula is too hot. Now, well, a couple reasons. So the nebular theory fails there. It can't grow the planets quickly enough. Since it's, well, let's focus on it being too hot. Since it's hot, what that means is the particles are moving around quickly. They're bouncing around at high speed. And when they bounce into each other, they bounce off. For them to stick, they have to come in slowly. They come in slowly and the intramolecular forces can grab on and link them together. If you come in quickly, you just bounce off. And that's the problem. We can't grow plants fast enough because it's too hot. So, the solution is something called the nebular, sorry, the condensation theory. And this is basically the nebular theory that got us most of the way plus dust. Dust plays a critical role. It plays two critical roles, actually, as we'll see. So what is dust? Uh, dust is just carbon and silicon. And we've talked about carbon before and silicon. Carbon is the special element where in its outer shell, it has four electrons and four holes, which makes it uh, very readily willing to bond onto other things and form very complicated structures very quickly. Silicon too, but there's a lot more carbon. So in the giant cloud of gas before it ever collapsed, you formed a lot of these dust grains they get up to about a micron in size. Many are smaller, but the biggest ones are about one micron across, a millionth of a, of a meter. And here's one of them under a microscope. Now, they're useful for two reasons. And the first reason is they can cool down the nebula. Let's write that down here. The dust is important for two reasons. One, they cool the nebula. 
How do they do this? Well, they'll absorb light, any light that has a wavelength shorter than their extent. They're about a micron across, the big ones. So they'll absorb light that's less than a micron. So that's visible light, ultraviolet light. The nebula's hot. So remember your black body physics from lesson three, Wien's law. If it has a high temperature, that means you're going to have a lot of visible light and maybe ultraviolet light. And that stuff will get absorbed by the dust grains. And they then act as little planets. Think about what Earth does. It absorbs visible light. It warms up the planet using our temperature equation. Then it spits it out as infrared. It converts it from visible to infrared. We don't have any plants yet, but we have these dust grains. They do the same thing. They absorb visible. They warm up to a certain temperature. You can use the exact same temperature equation that we used on the planets, and um, they'll spit out infrared. I made this myself, by the way, using Microsoft Paint. <laughs> anyway, uh, the infrared, the wavelength is much longer. It's bigger than the dust grains. So they can move right through the dust grains as if they're not there. They don't, you know, once you get to these longer wavelengths, uh, it's not blocked anymore. So it's converting the high energy radiation into low energy radiation, which can then escape the nebula. Here's an example of that. This is the Orion Nebula, pretty famous nebula. You go to the constellation Orion, go down to the belt and the sword, the middle star and the sword. If you look at it through binoculars, you realize it's not a star, it's a fuzzy region. It's a star forming region. And it's on the edge of a giant cloud. You can see it here. The cloud goes off to the, the left in this image. It's huge. The cloud is huge. It's much bigger than your computer screen. You probably fill, fill the room you're in. And this is just a little pocket on the edge where that pocket has collapsed and formed stars, not just one, but many of them. And those stars are producing visible light. Some of it's leaking out here because it's on the edge of the cloud, but some of it's going back into the cloud. And we can't see that in this picture on the right. This is the visible light picture on the right. Can't see it because the dust, the dust is blocking it from escaping. But the dust absorbs it, converts it into infrared, and then that can escape. And we see that here where you have these dark boundary regions, they're glowing in the infrared, particularly around these stars up here. The dust around is absorbing it, converting it to infrared, and it can escape. So that's what dust is doing. It's converting visible to infrared, it can escape, and then the nebula can cool down because the energy is escaping. Here's just another example. This is a disk out there in space. This is pictured in the infrared. So you see all this down converted radiation uh, just streaming out of the nebula, allowing it to cool down. And once it cools down, the particles move more slowly so they can stick together and accretion can take place. So that's the primary thing. That's well, one of two things the dust grains do. They cool the nebula so accretion can proceed. Problem is it's not gonna proceed fast enough. Even cooling the nebula and just building it up one atom at a time takes too long, longer than the time you have. You spend almost all the time trying to build up to the micron scale, and then you have no time left to go from micron scale to planet scale. But uh, the dust grains save us again. This is the second thing the dust does. They act as platforms for accretion. We don't need to spend all that time building up micron size structures because we already have them. You know, the cloud is full of atoms, but embedded in these atoms, we have these comparatively massive, big dust grains. And so we don't have to build up to this scale. We already have these things. They're platforms and the atoms can just stick to it and grow big really quick. So this is a, a, a time shortcut. We get to skip over this initial growing stage and just go from here and then you can produce planets, things as large as planets in the time you have before the star turns on and blows out your supply of gas ending accretion. It's the same reason we have raindrops actually. Now up in the clouds we have a lot of water molecules and they clearly come together, stick together, form a drop that then falls down to earth. But that process of accreting a raindrop takes too long. And they also use dust. There's some grain of dust floating up there in the clouds and the water molecules adhere to it and you can grow up a raindrop pretty quickly, then falls down. If it wasn't for dust up in the clouds, 
it would never rain. It would just kind of mist on us, I guess. And also you've probably heard of seeding clouds and people can fly up in clouds and release, um, I don't think they release dust, but they release something that behaves in the same way. It's a platform for the water molecules to stick to so you can force it to rain. They do that to water crops and stuff. Okay, so we've solved our problems. We took the nebular theory, we threw in dust, and now we can actually make planets in the time that we need. Here's a, a picture showing that. This is um, taken with ALMA. This is a millimeter wavelength interferometer, so like short radio waves. We talked about it briefly back in lesson four in Chile. And you can see the bands. This is, we don't see the planets, but somewhere in these dark bands, there are planets forming. And they've already scooped up the dust in that, or sorry, the gas in that band and will continue to do so growing larger and larger until you have a solar system. So this is a solar system in formation. Pretty cool picture. Okay, so that explains most of the questions from that I listed at the beginning. But now let's dive a little bit more into what makes a terrestrial world, what makes a, a Jovian world. And there's a lot going on in this figure, but it, it's worth spending a little bit of time on. The blue curve here, and let me slide down in my slide deck over here so I see where I am. Yep, uh, the blue curve here shows the temperature of the nebula. Oh, someone raised a hand, go ahead. We went on about a uh, conservation theory. So if dust is cooling down the nebula, wouldn't that slow down accretion because there's less uh, kinetic energy and less collision? Uh, so, yeah, I see what you're saying. If you cool down the nebula, the particles are moving more slowly, you're going to have less collisions. But when you do have them, they'll stick together. That's the difference. Before you had the collisions, nothing was sticking, so you got nowhere. Here we'll finally start getting somewhere. Yep. Okay, so in this plot, we're looking at the temperature. Clearly, the temperature of the nebular gas is going to be higher close to the sun and colder farther away. So at any given distance, we have a single temperature. That doesn't mean all the particles are moving around at the same speed. We saw this when we were talking about planetary atmospheres, how you can lose the lightweight components and retain the heavier components. It's actually probably worth just putting that equation up there again. We don't need to use it, but just so you can see the dependence, the average speed of the particles at any distance from the sun is going to be 0 0.159 kilometers per second times the square root of the temperature over the molecular mass. So particles with a low molecular mass at the same temperature will move around quicker and will be more likely to bounce off of each other and not accrete than heavy particles. Uh, at the same temperature, they'll move around more slowly and hence be more likely to stick together. So what accretes and what doesn't? Well, let's list out our elements and what we have to work with. We have hydrogen and helium. Those are the primary things. Then we have methane, ammonia, water. That's the next tier. And then we have trace things like rocky, particles, metals, far more rare, but heavier. So here we have things that are more abundant. Down to less abundant. And these things up here are lighter weight going down to heavier. So close to the sun where it's quite hot, the lightweight particles like hydrogen and helium will be moving around very quick and they will not accrete. And, and we know that. We know the hydrogen and helium doesn't stick until you get to the outer solar system. But neither will the water, ammonia, methane, and actually not too many rocks either. But the metals, those are the heaviest. They're very rare. There's not much of them, but they're gonna be moving slower at these higher temperatures. So that's the type of particle, particle that's more likely to stick together. So close to the sun, you're going to form metal cores. And the farther you get, you'll be able to incorporate more and more rocks, the, the next lightest particle after metals. We go up in this direction, rocky particles are a little bit lighter. So as it cools down, you can build more rocks in as well. 
And if you look at the, the planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, had a, a good mix of rocks and metals. You get out to Mars and you have a lot more rock than metal. It's not that you're incorporating less metal, it's just more, you know, the same amount of metal can stick. It's just, you have more rocky particles moving slow enough that they can stick too. Then you get out to four or five AU and that's where the magic happens. There it's cool enough that you can now also accrete the next thing on the list here, water. And there's a lot more water than rocky and metallic particles. And so you can build very large water balls. And they're actually ice balls. This is the temperature where it's cold enough that water is in an ice form and those ice particles stick together pretty easily. So you can build much bigger planetary cores. We call them planetesimals, actually. Let me write that down. Planetesimals, kind of like wannabe planets. They're, they're growing, trying to get bigger. So you can form a water planetesimal. You get out to Saturn orbit and the ammonia sticks now. So you can form water ammonia cores. And you get out to, out by Neptune, you can have water ammonia and methane. So you're making water cores, water ammonia cores, water ammonia methane cores. And most of them, that's all they'll ever be. You get these kind of dirty ice balls, basically. But some of them hit a critical mass. Once you hit that critical mass, you can have what's called runaway accretion. Instead of just sitting there waiting for things to bump into you and stick, once you become massive enough, your gravitational field can pull gas in from the nebula, allowing you to grow much, much faster, much more quickly. And that's what we're seeing in this artist rendering of the Beta Pictoris system. Here we have a planetesimal, a planetary core, mostly water, maybe water ammonia. And it got massive enough that now it's sucking in material from the nebula. And so it'll be pulling in everything, hydrogen, helium, water, ammonia, methane, rocky materials, metallic materials, everything comes in. And just like this is a big whirlpool in which planets are forming, this is now a little whirlpool. And so it's like a little version of the, of the whole. And if planets form in the big one, you're gonna have little worlds form in little ones. And we call those the moons. So here's Jupiter. It achieved that critical mass, had a runaway accretion. It formed its own little nebular disk around it. And in it, uh, we have Io, Europa, Ganymede, Callisto that formed, naturally forming moons. So, you know, we're explaining a lot here. Anyway, this continues until, as I said before, the sun turns on, starts burning, nuclear burning, nuclear fusion of hydrogen into helium. And then uh, you have, once that happens, you have uh, the solar wind begins. That's gas flowing off the sun, causing a gas pressure. You also have a, um, you have light pressure. The sun's producing light, and you don't think about it when light strikes you, you don't feel any pressure, but if a photon strikes just an atom by itself, it can actually push it. And so between the gas pressure and the light pressure, the newborn star pushes everything out, all the gas pushes it out, and so that's the end of accretion. Whatever you've built so far, that's all you're going to get. You may have some planets, and you're going to have a whole bunch of protoplanets as well, planetesimals. Now, Anything beyond this is evolutionary. I said, okay, how does it, you know, how can we get to a state that explains almost everything? And we're here now. But then you have evolutionary effects. You probably formed twice as many planets as we have today and a whole bunch of these um, planetesimals. And they're then going to uh, run into each other. So you're going to have impacts and you will also have interactions where they don't actually hit each other, but it's a close encounter that redirects one or the other. And just real quickly, let's just review our evidence for impacts and interactions. Uh, Mercury, super metallic core. Now forming close to the sun, it should have been pretty metallic, but it's even more metallic than it should have been. We saw this was possibly due to a major collision. Venus's backwards rotation, we introduced three possible explanations, one of which was a big collision. 
the formation of Earth's moon, an impact that threw off mantle material forming the moon. The lowlands, the northern lowlands of Mars, almost certainly a glancing blow to the northern hemisphere, melting just the top of the planet, removing some of the material. The gas giants, their tilts, not with Saturn, that was a special case of resonance with Neptune, but uh, Jupiter, it's tipped, it says 10 degrees here. Uranus and Neptune significantly tipped, uh, quite probably, and quite possibly due to major impacts tipping over these worlds, particularly Uranus and Neptune, since they're less massive. If they got hit by something of similar size, it would certainly tip them over. Uh, the moon Miranda uh, orbiting Uranus. Uh, we talked about this. This appears to have been a slow impact of two worlds that just kind of stuck together. And then we have some near misses, interactions. We saw Triton was captured, the large moon of Neptune, because it's orbiting backwards. And Nereid here is in this extremely eccentric orbit, which suggests it might have also been captured. So, on to, so, you know, we've already been through the evidence. There's lots of evidence for these evolutionary regularities. Uh, but let's continue with these interactions. Triton and Nereid are examples of interactions, but there are many, many more that had to have taken place. So here's the solar system shortly after it formed. We have our four gas giants, and then we have a whole bunch of these planetesimals everywhere. And what will happen is the ones that are orbiting out among the gas giants, eventually they'll have close encounters with the gas giants, and they'll be slung off in a different direction. Just like when we send spacecraft to the outer solar system, we on purpose put them close to planets so that the planet can slingshot them off in a new direction in a higher speed. This is going to happen, but not in a planned or predicted way, but a random way with all these planetesimals. So let's think about what happens to them. The ones that form out beyond Neptune, there are no planets out here to toss them around, so they just stay there. And that's the beginning of the Kuiper Belt. It's not everything in the Kuiper Belt, but stuff that formed there is still going to be there. Then you have the ones that interact with Uranus and Neptune, the smaller gas giants. And Uranus and Neptune will push them a little bit. They're small gas giants. They're not going to push them a lot. Uh, they'll push most of them inwards towards Jupiter and Saturn, but it'll push some of them outwards into the Kuiper Belt. So the Kuiper Belt's made of things that form there and things that Uranus and Neptune pushed out there. And Jupiter and Saturn also, if it wasn't a super close encounter, can push things out there too, but mostly Uranus and Neptune. Then the stuff that gets too close to Jupiter and Saturn, those are big, massive worlds, and it'll throw those really far off. Most will be thrown down into the sun, but some will be thrown out well beyond the Kuiper belt, and that forms the Oort cloud. All these objects out here on strange orbits that will come back, they'll come back as comets. That's what these planetesimals become. They get sh you know, slung out by Jupiter and Saturn and come back uh, periodically as comets. One last effect, and then we'll take a look at the Kuiper belt in the Oort cloud. Again, I'm going to run a little bit over today. Newton's third. I think back to Newton's laws. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So most of these planetesimals get thrown inwards. It means the planets are going to recoil an inch outwards. It's like shooting a cannon ball from a cannon. The cannon ball goes far, but the cannon will also move a little bit as well. If you're sending most stuff inwards, then the planets inch out outwards. So the solar system is a little bit bigger uh, today than it was initially because of just the process of clearing out all this debris caused recoils. Now it's possible in this motion, Uranus and Neptune switched places. There's some simulations that suggest that's the case. And if that's the case, when they passed by each other, they probably that could also explain their extreme tips. But it's a little speculative, we don't know. When we talk about planets going around other systems, we'll see this kind of recoil, but sometimes it's not gentle. Our solar system, it's a case where the planets moved a little. But there's some where you can have a gas giant move a lot and really mess the system up. And we'll see examples of that around other stars. Let's take a look at the Kuiper Belt. Uh, most famous object in the Kuiper Belt is, of course, Pluto. And here you can see its orbit and its Neptune crossing. 
which means this is something that didn't form out there in the Kuiper belt. It formed closer in and Neptune pushed it out. And every now and then it comes back and it's actually closer to the sun, uh, like between 79 and 99, Pluto was closer to the sun than Neptune. The orbits tilted and changed. They're not gonna run into each other or have another close encounter, but in the past, that's probably how Pluto got out there. Here's an early picture of Pluto. It's actually the first one where we noticed the moon Charon. Here's a later picture. You can see Charon and its moons Nix and Hydra, and an even later picture where they blocked most of the light from Pluto and Charon, so you can see the moons, and they picked out Styx and Kerberos. That's a really busy system. This is the best picture we have of Pluto before we flew by in 2015. Two Hubble Space Telescope pictures, super pixelated, best we could do. These are computer models of what the surface looks like based upon these pixelated images. But then in 2015, the New Horizons spacecraft flew by and we got some you know, really good pictures of Pluto. Also good pictures of the moon Charon, where we can see this dark region up here that they named Mordor from Lord of the Rings. And also pictures of some of the smaller moons. This is Charon for comparison. The small moons are pretty small, just miles across. Also going on out here in the Kuiper Belt, uh, the second most famous object is Eros, and, or, or sorry, Eris. And uh, here's the discovery image. You can see it moving there. And they then figured out the orbit and they figured out the mass and the size, just like we did back in lesson five, and realized it's about the same size as Pluto, but more massive. This is the one that caused Pluto to be demoted. Uh, to a dwarf planet, and this is also a dwarf planet with its moon Dysnomia. And then there are many other worlds out there as well. Maki Maki and Haumea have been declared to be dwarf planets. Next biggest one is Sedna, which we'll see in next slides, pretty interesting, but it goes on and on. There are dozens of worlds out there. Altogether, we call them trans-Neptunian objects. Most of them are in the Kuiper Belt. So here you can see the Kuiper Belt, you see Pluto, it's Neptune crossing. Eris is pretty eccentric. So this is probably something that got close to Pluto and got pushed out into a very eccentric orbit. Though Haumea and Makimaki, they're nice circular orbits out here in the Kuiper Belt, they probably formed there. So again, examples of both types, worlds that formed there and worlds that got pushed out into the Kuiper Belt. Then you have Sedna here. It goes way, way out. Um, it takes 11,000 years to go around its orbit. So this is probably something that got too close, not to Neptune, but to Jupiter and got slung way out going out to the Oort cloud. And it's recently come back and we discovered it and it will be gone and come back in another 11,000 years. So in the Kuiper belt, here's the distribution of Kuiper belt. Um, there are distances from the uh, sun. Most of them are about 40 some AU from the sun. Then you have this weird excess at 40 astronomical units. And this is a resonance. It's a 2-1 constructive resonance. Now we've seen a 2-1 destructive resonance before. The objects, uh, anything orbiting in the Cassini division goes around twice for every time the moon Mimas goes around once. And so Mimas is pulling things out of the Cassini division. That's a 2-1 destructive resonance. The more massive things on the outside, it's destructive. If the more massive things on the inside, it's constructive. So for every two times Neptune goes around, anything at 40 AU will be reinforced. Things, you work through the physics and instead of pulling things out of that orbit, it pushes things into that orbit. So that's a 2-1 constructive resonance and makes this over density right at 40 AU. Pluto is one of them. And so we call these the plutoids. The plutoids are a subset of the Kuiper Belt objects that are in a constructive 2-1 resonance with Neptune. We'll see another example with resonances, destructive resonances in the asteroid belt in the video I'll shoot on Sunday. So lastly, I know I'm over, but give me a few minutes. Uh, the Oort cloud and the comets, these are objects that did not form out there. These were all chucked out. It's not like the Kuiper Belt where some things formed there. These were all chucked out by Jupiter and Saturn on these very eccentric orbits and they come back and they come back as comets. And as they get close, because you know they're just dirty snowballs 
And so as they get close, they warm up and vapor comes off of them, making kind of a cloud around it called a coma and also a tail. And the tail actually has two parts. Uh, if the particles coming off are charged, the solar wind catches them and pushes them exactly opposite the sun. And we call that the ion tail. These are charged particles coming off the comet and the solar wind pushes them directly away from the sun. And then you have particles that are not charged and they're thrown off and then they just orbit the sun on their own. And so the dust tail, um, the farther out you go, it develops a curvature because these particles are in a slightly different orbit than these. So you have two tails, both point away from the sun, the ion tail directly away, but the dust tail, the uncharged particles, once they're released, they orbit the sun too. And it's a mistake to think the tail is behind the comet. Uh, it is when it's coming in, but when it's going out, that it goes tail first, and the head of the comet is actually behind the tail as it leaves, because they point away from the sun. Most famous comet is Halley's Comet. It, uh, these pictures are from 1910. Uh, that's the first time we got photographs of it. And it comes by every 75 years. So before this, it was 1835 when it came by. This is when Mark Twain was born. He was born when the comet came and he always said he'd die when the comet comes again. And he did, he, he passed in 1910. The next passage was 1986. I was around for this one, but it was not very spectacular. It never got close to earth. It was hard to see, uh, but you know, we could take better pictures because we had better imaging technology, better telescopes. Here it is. And this is the first time we got up, to a, up close to a comet. We didn't plan this. We said, oh, here comes Halley's Comet. What do we have up there? And we redirected some spacecraft to fly close to it. So we had some flybys and got our first picture of a comet up close. You can see the gas being vented out here. It will come again in 2061. That time it will get within one AU of Earth and be a lot more spectacular to look at. And most of you will be around for that uh, I might even be as well, we'll have to see, but that should be fun to see when it happens. And the time after that, none of us will be here, that's uh, 2134, it's going to get within a tenth of an AU and be the brightest thing in the sky other than Venus, Jupiter, and the moon. So it's going to be really amazing that time, but unfortunately we won't see that one. A few more here. Uh, this, I have a little video for this one. I've mentioned this one before. This is the Deep Impact mission in 2005. We'll let that get started here. Now I'll run it and fast forward since I'm way over today. I only have maybe about 10 more slides here and I'll do them quick. So this is a mission in 2005. We sent it to the Comet Temple 1 and dropped an impactor onto it that blew out a lot of the material up into space. Here you can see a picture of that. So we could then study that material using telescopes back here on Earth. This is primordial stuff. This is the stuff the solar system was made of, no geological activity. So by studying it, we're studying our origins. More recently, we had the Rosetta mission to this comet. This is 67P slash C dash G. Um, wish it had a better name. And we sent uh, the Rosetta mission, it's a European mission, and it had a lander called Phile, and we actually landed on the comet. I mentioned this back in, last, in lesson five, and here we've kind of drawn in where we think it landed, but it landed in shadow. So its, it's battery pack ran out, the solar panels didn't recharge. It only lasted about an hour. It was supposed to ride the comet for months, ride it around the sun, and it did ride it, but it was dead. We didn't get much information from it. The other interesting uh, comet interaction it was back in 2004. There's a mission called Stardust. This is the comet Wild 2. I think it's pronounced Wild 2. And it passed through the tail and exposed this, it's called an aerogel, very low density stuff to the tail and cometary particles got embedded in it. And then it came back to earth and, and dropped uh, this in a container in 2006 with the heat shield and parachute. So we've actually brought back piece of a comet and can study the primordial solar system in this way. Last thing will be meteors, meteor showers, and meteor storms. 
So when comets are going on their path, they leave all this dust and debris behind. And it just keeps orbiting forever and ever. And sometimes Earth will intersect one of these cometary orbits. And if dust enters our atmosphere, it burns up making a meteor. And some of them can be pretty spectacular. But most of those meteors that you've seen, it's just like a, a micron particle burning up in our atmosphere. Now, when we do pass through these, we'll probably encounter not just one grain of dust, but a whole bunch of them. And we call these meteor showers. And you can go out at certain times of year when we periodically keep crossing through these cometary paths over and over. And you just let your eyes adapt and you watch. And if it's a dark night, you can see a bunch of them. They all appear to emanate from the same part in the sky. And this is a time lapse, so you have many of them. Um, but they come one at a time. And, you know, we named the showers after where they appear to come from, like the uh, Leonids in December from the constellation Leo. But it's a perspective thing. We're running into a swarm of these particles, and it's a perspective thing, so they seem to radiate from a single point in space. The last thing here under comets is the storm. I've never seen one. They only occur about once every 50 years. You got to be really, really lucky. The comet passed recently and left a really dense you know, uh, chain of dust. And these dust cha uh, chains, they kind of fall apart over time. But if you have a recent one, you pass right through the middle of it. Really rare for it to happen, but you'll have thousands of meteors you know, per minute. Uh, this, the sky just lights up. It seems like the world is coming to an end. And we have engravings and things from when this has happened in the past. Very rare occurrence, something I've always wanted to see. Anyway, thanks for staying the extra 10 minutes. I'll shoot the final video on, you know, we've done the Kuiper Belt, the Oort Cloud. I'll shoot a video on the asteroid belt, including asteroids that pass close to Earth and, and asteroids that hit Earth, mass extinctions. And I'll talk also a little bit about planets around other stars. Again, I'll shoot that Sunday and put on the YouTube site. Okay, that's it. And uh, I'll stick around for questions, but otherwise see you Monday for SETI. Thank you, Professor. Have a good weekend. You too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can I see the notes again, Thank please? You. Yes, absolutely. This batch or the earlier batch? This batch. <coughs> okay. Thank you.